Welcome, Wanderers. Welcome to episode 72 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And favorite games is right. Fallout 4 is definitely one of my favorites, especially of this generation. So on account of that, I did something a little bit special for this episode. But I'm not going to hold you back any longer. Let's find out what this thing is and get going. And you may be asking yourself already, why am I looking at shaky camera footage from this goon? And that's because we're on a street corner of Boston looking at the Capitol building and comparing this exact same corner in the world of Fallout 4. And if you're standing on this exact corner, there are only subtle differences here. Like for example, instead of the trees from the park covering up the Capitol building, in Fallout 4 you got the buildings across the street obstructing some of the view. But just comparing Fallout 4 to real life is not what we do here on Boundary Break. And I wouldn't be wasting your time here unless there was a personal spin that I could add to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare a zoom out of the Boston Common in real life versus how it is in Fallout 4, with the Capitol building as a reference point. And as it becomes very apparent as you zoom out, the Boston Common in Fallout 4 is way smaller than it is in real life. Which is to be expected, nothing in Fallout is one to one. But as you're going to see in this transition here, the scale of Boston in Fallout 4 is so much smaller than the Boston in real life that just the parks alone in the real Boston actually reach past the outskirts of Boston in Fallout 4. Next up is the starting area of Fallout 4, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you actually came here for this. For some reason, as beautiful as this area is, it's very short-lived and very restricted. But outside of the Wanderer's House, there's a lot of stuff to see. All the homes and cars are pre-war, so everything looks really nice, and they even have interiors to all the vehicles. Like, for example, this one over here seems to use a television screen? Uh, I don't- okay. I mean, this one over here seems a lot more conventional, I- <laughs> I'm just kinda curious. Eh, uh, but moving on. Just how far does this area actually go? And well, let me show you. Well, it might not look like much because outside of all the beautiful trees is a barren wasteland. The developers did overcompensate on how many trees they really need to put into this area. Because outside of the cliff that the vault is actually placed on, you don't really get a great look at the depth of any of these areas without dying immediately from the bomb blast. Though it should be noted, since you can see quite a decent view from this cliffside, a lot of Boston's biggest buildings are off in the distance. And if we rush over there real quick, we can see that it's all pre-war, despite the fact that the player should never be able to see the detail of these things, given the distance and the fog. Also, oddly enough, the vault door seems to have a black dome on top of it with back face culling. People who've watched my videos in the past will probably recognize this effect whenever I looked at a skybox in a normal game. But outside of that, there's really not much to look at, so we'll do a zoom out and move on. So next up is a viewer request, and as always, you can follow me on Twitter if you ever feel like you have a wish list for a certain game as what you want to see. But anyways, they want to know what happens with Kellogg and the scientist after they take the baby. And only to dispel some curiosity here, because I do admit it's not that exciting. Once Kellogg and the scientist are off screen, they just kind of stand in place without anything really out of the ordinary going on. In fact, they're not even frozen in place, which is something that you would typically see if you were to look at the ending animation for a scripted scene that you weren't allowed to see. <laughs> Next up is the Death Claw when you first help out the Minutemen. This iconic enemy comes out of the ground this time around, specifically a metal plate. Now I just wanted to see if the Death Claw was there waiting the entire time. It turns out he manifests into the game the moment that he starts banging his way through. But what's actually really cool here is that the second that he is summoned into the game, there's an animation that the player would never be able to see before he pokes his head out into the street. Next up is Diamond City, and as anyone who's played this game knows, if you go into Diamond City, it has to load up the city, and if you leave the city, it has to load up the entire world. So the question we want to answer here is, what does Diamond City look like before you enter it, and when you're in Diamond City, what does it look like when you get out? Well, when you look at it from the outside looking in, you can see that it's all very low poly stuff, there's absolutely no details to the buildings whatsoever, outside of looking like a bunch of rusty boxes. Now as for what's outside the stadium when you're actually in there, uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised 
surprised by this. Apparently, the city of Boston goes into low poly mode, but it's essentially all there. The stadium itself is stacked so high that you really wouldn't be able to see pretty much any of this. But I suppose the biggest reason for all this is so that the city can actually look very populated when you're outside all of the buildings. Because outside of that, the game handles itself very well as far as loading in details and buildings. And you know what, there's actually one thing I want to explain on my show right now. It's just one of those things where you think that everybody's in the know about it, but you end up surprised by how many people have no idea. In a lot of games, in especially open world games, there is a thing called level of detail. And in Fallout 4, there's different stages of details depending on how far away you are from buildings or objects. And I thought it'd be fun, even if you know what LOD is, to show you at least one building in Boston in all of its various stages of detail. And if you were unaware about all this, developers have been getting away with this for years by hiding these low poly details behind other effects like fog and blur depending on how far away you are from the object. Another viewer request was for Swan. Folks want to know what he's doing underneath that water before you actually activate the fight. And I gotta admit, I was hoping for something a little more ridiculous. I was expecting him to at least have his limbs caved in on each other, but that's not the case. But I did end up finding something kind of interesting here. You see, inside of Swan's body is a branch, like many others that you can see on his body. And for whatever reason, this one branch is completely untextured, which is why it has that bright pink look. Now, one of the most interesting things about Fallout 4 that comes from one of the most least interesting things in video games in general is the way it handles doors. Yeah, doors of all things. Let me run you down how this all works. So if you open a door in Fallout 4 and it doesn't have an opening animation whatsoever, it means that there's likely just a flat wall directly behind the door. However, any door that opens in Fallout 4, or even just a crack, likely has something behind it, whether it be triangular geometry or perhaps a low poly version of the entire outdoors. It's just that what's fundamentally odd about all this is that there's no consistency to it. One might want to ask themselves why they even bother to make some doors open a crack at all, or if you want to go through that extra effort, sure, but why don't you just have basic geometry behind every door? I don't know, but either way, it was a ton of fun for me. But if you're a fan of basic geometry, and who isn't, I'm sure there's a long way to get inside of that exclusive club. All of you have no further to look than the very edge of the map in Fallout 4. Now normally the game stops you whenever you try to walk outside the boundaries of the game. It's very clear that at certain points you're just not allowed to go any further. But if you were allowed to go any further, this is what you would see. The world ends in a 90 degree angle, much like how the map does when you reference it. And in the bottom left hand corner of the map, you can see that the land ends a few feet away from the ocean. And then the ocean meets at the corner and you can also see the ocean floor and see how far that goes before that ends as well. A quick little update to this segment, if you take the character model past the edge of the map, the game will actually leave a square of water underneath the player at all times. Very thoughtful. I was kind of at odds with myself on whether or not to save this for the sequence break episode. And you'll totally see why in a second. So what we're going to be looking at here is the Pridwin, the flying airship of the Brotherhood of Steel. And after you defeat Kellogg, you'll see the ship flying across the sky, which gives you now an opportunity to fast travel or regular travel over to where the Pridwin docks. But if you were fast enough to move manually through the sky and get to the docking station before the Pridwin does, something really interesting starts to happen. One thing you've probably already noticed is that all the objects that are supposed to be on the stationary version of the Pridwin are already there, hanging in the sky. But even more interesting than that is that when the prop Pridwin starts to come into the docking station, the stationary version of the Pridwin actually loads in before the prop one can finish moving into place. So for a very short period of time, there's actually two Pridwins here. Virgil from the Glowing Sea also has something interesting to hide. If we take the camera inside of Virgil's head, he has an extra set of teeth. Now these teeth don't serve any purpose at all. I thought maybe once he starts talking, the two sets of teeth swap out or something, but no, this set of teeth that's in the back of his head doesn't move or do anything.
Though a lot of people were asking what happens to the MIT building after it explodes. And from that suggestion, I actually have two things to show you. The first one I want to show you is what actually happens, like you asked. It basically just immediately swaps out the vanilla version of MIT versus the post-nuked MIT area. Plus that enormous explosion that you see before the Brotherhood of Steel ending is actually just a whole bunch of 2D textures. Now I gotta admit, it's actually pretty convincing looking when you're just standing there on top of the building, but when you angle the camera in certain different ways, you can see very little resources used to pull this effect off. I just want to start a flame in your heart. And of course, we gotta do a zoom out of the entire map of Fallout 4, or at least as much as we possibly can before there's pretty much nothing left to see. guys that was the fallout 4 episode i don't know how oh i got a little friend here what's going on little guy sorry uh yeah anyways that's the fallout 4 episode um i don't know how people do vlogging out in public it's very weird that people start looking at you and stuff but i figured you know this is like one opportunity to do this in uh my city of boston what, where did my capitol building go there it is now i'm kind of out of shot anyways this is not going over well so I'll, I'll see you guys next week. Take care. Oh, watch, watch a playlist or something.